There are definitely very important steps that you can take to prevent becoming ill from coronavirus. But if you focus on the wrong thing, you're probably going to die. Hi, I'm Tom Anderson, and this is the Anderson Alternative Channel. I'm going to divert a little bit from my main focus of this channel today, which is alternative energy and off-grid homesteading. And I want to talk a little bit about alternative medicine. Um, and I don't mean anything woo-woo like auras or crystals or anything like that. Um, what I'm talking about is hard science-backed data that just doesn't make it into the mainstream big pharma medical paradigm or the mainstream media politicized reporting that you might hear. But these are things that can help you to stay well, whether it's from chronic disease or, you know, from pandemic illnesses, which is what we're going to talk about today with the coronavirus. Um, let me just start off by saying that uh, while all of the information that I'm about to give you is extremely well researched, um, I'm not a licensed doctor. And so and even if I were, I couldn't give personalized medical advice over a YouTube video anyway. Um, so none of this should be taken as individual medical advice for your particular circumstances, but just as general information that you can use to make informed choices for yourself. Um, I'll cite all my sources so you can go ahead and confirm everything that I say. Uh, you don't take my word for it. In fact, I'd rather you not take my word for it. I'd rather you uh, go ahead and do the research for yourself as well. Um, so like I said, my channel is primarily about alternative energy, and I do have a couple of projects and videos in the works on thermoelectric generators. So um, I will try to get to that as soon as I can. But um, you yeah, know, this is sort of a, a timely topic right now with this coronavirus outbreak. And so I wanted to talk about this now because um, although you know, obviously the alternative energy stuff is important um, and you know, if you want to skip this video and get right back to that, I totally respect that. But I think that this is extremely important to talk about right now um, to prepare for it or at least to understand it and know what's going on. So we don't know yet, you know, how severe this coronavirus issue is going to become. Um, there have been thousands of confirmed cases in China, and they've quarantined entire cities there. Uh, we also have over 100 cases in the United States um, as of this time. Uh, you know, whenever you watch this, it could be you know well developed beyond that. Um, but there are also reported infections on every single continent, save for Antarctica. The scariest part about the virus is that uh, its virulence, or uh, you know, the amount that it spreads is uh, growing exponentially and uh, it's transmissible from human to human without any symptoms being present. So uh, you know, a few months ago, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hosted Event 201, which was a high level pandemic exercise that actually simulated a disease almost exactly like the one that's occurring right now. Now, I'm not going to get into any sort of conspiracy theories about that because you know, they do these simulations almost all the time. Um, you know, these types of pandemics are uh, a, a very big uh, concern for people that you know, are in this area of study. You know, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, that's what they're all about. And so they do these kinds of simulations about a lot. But it just so happens that in October, they did a simulation of a coronavirus. In, in this case, their fictional scenario had starting as a, um, a swine born illness that was transmitted to humans in Brazil. And in that simulation, they had a, a group of uh, policymakers and business leaders and health officials who all took part and uh, you know, basically tried to test what kind of responses they would have. And no matter what they did, they could not stop a pandemic from resulting. And in their scenario, they actually ended up having a death toll of 65 million people within 18 months. Um, plus a economic cost of like half a trillion dollars. So this is obviously not something to be taken lightly. Um, this is a big issue and it's something that re we really need to think about preparing for right now. But to th keep things in perspective, only about 100 people or a little over 100 people have died as of right now from the coronavirus. Whereas in the United States, since October 2019 until January 18th, 2020, up to 21 million people in the United States have been infected with the seasonal influenza virus. And up to 20,000 deaths can be attributed to the flu in that time frame, according to the CDC. So 
As of right now, the flu is a much bigger public health issue in the United States. However, that because of the virulence and the mortality rate of the coronavirus, that could eclipse the seasonal flu in short order. Some coronaviruses transmit easily from person to person and others do not. The current strain, which is called 2019 NCOV, was identified as a novel coronavirus by the World Health Organization on December 31st of 2019. Or as of today, the Wuhan coronavirus has an estimated 2.4% mortality rate, which is calculated by dividing the number of deaths by the total number infected. And so that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still really early. So there's only a recovery rate of 1.4%. So you know, of all the people who were infected, only 1.4% have basically beat the disease, which means that of all those infected, 98.6% are either still sick or have died. So we really don't know what the ultimate mortality rate is going to be as this thing progresses, but we know that in the SARS epidemic of 2003-2004, the mortality rate was about 10%. So, you know, if you're of the mindset to prepare for the coronavirus potentially becoming a pandemic in the United States or wherever you happen to live, there are definitely some, you know, some steps that you can take to prepare yourself for that. But there's also a lot of misinformation out there. And I wanted to dispel a little bit of what you might be hearing that could waste a lot of time and resources and not be very effective. So, especially from within prepper channels, the main thing that I've heard that I disagree with is the this exposure phobia. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm talking about is like hand washing and wearing N95 masks and you know, nitrile gloves, Tyvek suits, things to prevent the actual viruses from you know, making them, their way into your body. And it, it might sound like, you know, by common sense, that would be a great thing to prepare for. But in a pandemic of coronavirus, that's going to be basically ineffective. And let me tell you why. Coronavirus is transmitted by two principal vectors. The first is airborne respiratory droplets from the result of coughing or sneezing, right? These droplets can infect another person just by landing on any mucous membrane, including your nose, your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your genitals, and your anus. Now, you might think that those last two are not likely to be waving around in public, but if you happen to go to a public restroom and someone coughs or sneezes um, or even flushes a toilet, then you could be infected by that. Um, you could also get infected if droplets land on your skin and uh, or your clothes, and then you say scratch an itch or you know wipe your nose or something where it's, uh, it's, it's hard to control those kinds of automatic responses where if you have an itch, like say next to your eye and you scratch it, even if you have you know, wraparound glasses on, you might not even realize you just did it. And you just scratched your eye, you just wiped your nose, and that's all it takes. You've now moved some of these virus particles into your mucous membrane, and that's all it takes to infect you. Surgical masks, like the one shown here, are designed to prevent the wearer from spreading their germs to others, but they won't prevent inhalation of airborne germs. Their loose sides reduce their effectiveness as a barrier against disease. To block out the greatest number of airborne germs, you'd need an N95 respirator mask. This mask is what a surgeon would wear around a patient with a highly infectious disease like tuberculosis. These masks aren't a foolproof solution for the public either. Surgeons get their masks fitted and generally only wear them for a short period of time. Just buying a mask from the drugstore wouldn't give you the same snug fit around the mouth that keeps those germs from getting in. A study conducted by the University of New South Wales found that when worn correctly, these masks had an 80% efficacy rate of protecting the wearer against a proven viral infection. The same study found that mask usage compliance, or the portion of people using the masks effectively, was only 50%. With the non-compliant users incorporated, there was no difference in infection rate between the mask wearers and the control group. The other vector uh, is virus particles, also known as fomites, uh, that reside on surfaces such as, say, doorknobs or keyboards or bus seats or faucet handles or even toilet paper. And these are an effect of a infected person touching that surface and then leaving behind an infectious particle. And the other problem with coronavirus is we're still learning for this particular virus. How is it transmitted? Is it more by breathing in the virus particles or by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching your mouth or nose? So we don't know exactly how long those fomites are viable. 
Uh, normally, virus fomites are not viable for very long. For instance, the Ebola virus um, cannot survive very long outside of a living host. However, the 2010 study published in the Journal of Applied and Environmental Microbiology sought to establish the longevity of the SARS coronavirus fomites. The researchers uh, found that the coronaviruses were viable for up to 28 days on stainless steel at 40 degrees Celsius. Like I said, they're, they're an enveloped virus which has this protective coating around them that, that keeps them from degrading in the environment like other viruses do. In fact, uh, that's where the, the name coronavirus comes from because they have this basically crown of glycoproteins that goes around them that you can see under a microscope that makes it look like a corona, like with the sun. And that's protecting it from the environment, from oxygen, from you know UV rays, things like that. And so they can survive on surfaces for up to 28 days at around four degrees Celsius. Now in warmer conditions, they don't survive as long, but that's one of the reasons why coronaviruses like the common cold are more common during the winter time, because they're able to survive on these surfaces for much longer. So um, this gives the Wuhan coronavirus a so-called reproduction number of around 3.8. Uh, that is, for every infected person, they can infect, on average, 3.8 other people. And any reproduction number greater than one basically means that it's a pandemic level of infection rate, uh, and it's almost going to be impossible to control. And one of the reasons why um, the transmission rate is so high is because it's actually transmissible for several days before any symptoms are present. So before you even know that you have an infection of the coronavirus, you can be giving it to other people. People of, of good intention might, once they feel like they're sick, self-quarantine from other people. But if you don't know that you're sick, chances are you're not going to self-quarantine. So you're going to still interact with friends and family and co-workers if you don't know that you're sick. And so in that process, you will have infected many other people. So given all that, Unless you're planning to wear a fully isolated, positive pressure, level 4 hazmat suit, not only in public, but pretty much anywhere that another person who might have been exposed has been, including your own house if you don't live alone, then your efforts at preventing exposure are basically going to be symbolic only. If you wear a mask you know, out shopping and then you take it off in your home or in your car or you know, anywhere else, you're basically, there's no point in even doing it in the first place. Without total and complete isolation, it's just virtually impossible to prevent being infected. Which is why there's no cure for the common cold. Um, it's just it's too easy to get infected. Now, you know, admittedly, if you got a bolus shot of virus directly in your face by someone coughing in your face, um, that might be slightly more likely to get you sick. But chances are, no matter how careful you are, if, even if you don't get you know a cough directly in the face, if it's a pandemic and you live in society as opposed to some you know, remote mountain homestead, then even if you're wearing a mask and gloves and wraparound safety glasses and a Tyvek suit, you're still gonna pick up virus particles anyway. So you know, if you receive letters or packages in the mail, unless you burn your mail on your front lawn instead of opening it, you're, just, you're going to receive virus particles that way too. There's, there's almost unlimited vectors because of the amount of time that it's viable in the environment. So you know, and eventually you're gonna have to eat, eat food, you have to change your clothes, you have to wipe your butt, you have to do things where you know, these virus particles are going to come into contact with your mucous membranes. And so with, with viruses like Ebola, it's a little bit easier to disinfect surfaces and they can't you know, survive for as long outside of a host. But in viruses like this, they're just too capable in the environment to prevent transmission that way. So it's really a waste of time and money to focus on stockpiling personal protective equipment like N95 masks and nitrile gloves right now. That's not to say that you shouldn't have those supplies, uh, or you shouldn't use them if you have them, but it does uh, not contribute much to survivability to focus on that today. Again, I'm not saying don't have them or don't wear them, but focusing on that as your only or your primary method of preparation would be a mistake. But not all hope is lost. While it might be impossible to prevent getting infected, not all infection leads to a morbidity or mortality. That's a very important distinction. You know, morbidity is, is becoming sick and mortality is dying. Be, being infected just means that you have exposure to the infectious agent. It has gone into your system, but it has not gotten past that point. It has not gotten to the point of reproducing uncontrollably in your body. 
So there are definitely important steps that you can take to prevent becoming ill from coronavirus. It's just not going to be very effective to try to prevent the initial infection. As evidence of that, uh, I'm the father of two young boys who are both in daycare, and they get exposed to all kinds of things. And as a result, obviously, I get exposed as well. There's no way to prevent exposure from that. But I haven't been sick from the flu or the common cold in over five years. And that's because I'm taking steps to prevent the morbidity, but not the infection. And so uh, that'll be the subject of my next video, which is you know, how you can be exposed and infected with coronavirus, but still not become ill as a result. So please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon to get updates whenever I upload a new video. As I said at the beginning, I will be getting back to alternative energy and off-grid building, but I'm going to post at least one more video on how to avoid pandemic death first.